Um, so one of the developments out of the, the mediation project was probably CARM, um, the conversation analytic role play method mm -hmm. that you developed and um, pioneered. Um, can you tell us all about CARM? Yeah. At the end of the Neighbours project, when the funding ran out in 2008, one of the things that funding councils oblige you to do is to go and give something back to the people who have been your, uh, you know, the, the people who've given you data, the people who've given you access to their organisations. And I, I was very keen to do this. Um, I'm, I'm sure, well, Derek can watch this video later and decide whether he agrees with this, but, but Derek and I had different views about, um, let's just call it the applied end of things after a project's finished. And I think it's also, you know, a bit of an, a bit, something that people know about Derek and I, that we were, we used to be uh, in a couple and then we broke up um, and we get on fine and we're, we've become, we, you know, we've always been friends. But I think it, I think it's kind of, it, the, two, the, came, the end of the project came at an interesting time where I was starting to, you know, Derek and I were working less together and I really believed in going and taking anything useful back to the organisations um, and he wasn't really into that. So I did that. And I then realised that I had lots of potentially interesting things to say to mediation services um, and the environmental health services, but it was kind of interesting but not necessarily that useful to them. Um, so it, was, it might be interesting to them to know that a lot of their complaints that started out being about noise turned on, you know, identity sorts of issues, but you know, okay, that's interesting, but so what? And it was around this time that I started to think about how is it that um, people resist the service that's being offered. And one of the things that I've been interested in was how people say no to the offer of mediation. So callers typically resist mediation when it's offered to them, they don't, they don't really want that service. And it was one of the places that identity had cropped up in, in the calls. So people would often say, um, you know, I, the neighbour is the kind of person who won't mediate as a way out. So, so we've kind of seen that. Um, and that led me to think about, well, how is mediation being explained such that that kind of resistance is, becomes relevant? And that led me to look at um, how mediation was being explained in those calls and also what types of explanations seemed to engage callers and what didn't. And then about the same kind of time, I taught myself things in PowerPoint that um, some people will know, which is, which is how to roll out transcript and sound in sync so that you didn't know what was coming next. And those two things seemed to come together so that I could have groups of mediators living through real calls, which I knew were going to end in disaster, but they didn't, and get them to think about what they might do differently to stop that I'm not interested response coming out from, mm -hmm. from callers. Um, and so that so what happened was then I uh, applied for fo what was called follow-on funding from the funding council, and this these were this was funding to explicitly go and disseminate and engage and you know um, exchange knowledge with with your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So I had that funding, and the funding was to to, to do something like thirty six workshops um, in the UK and overseas, and I did at least 36 workshops to UK and US mediators. I found it very difficult to get into the police, but maybe we can come back to that later. Mm. Um, and by the time the funding went out and I'd given all of these services a free mm. workshop, I decided that um, I needed to call what I was doing something. And this was at the time when, as soon as the funding went out, mediation services started to ask for the training because by word of mouth they'd heard that I was able to show them things that would get them clients mm -hmm. and also stop them doing things that was putting their prospective clients off. Mm -hmm. So that was the that was the start of what then became came conversation on the role play method. Right. Um, so you said that getting into the police mm -hmm. was a bit difficult. Why is that? I think Derek and I had got access to police interviews with suspects in neighbour type crime, but um, they 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 were less open to the possibility of us coming back mm -hmm. and doing training, although I did go to Hendon and did, to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of pushy and persistent, so I did, you know, get people to agree to let me loose on their, um, on their employees, because these, these were free things that, that we were doing, they were funded by the ESRC, but there was a, just an open door with mediators, they, they became really interested, not surprisingly if you like, on 
um, knowing how best to get clients because most mediation services they they rely on clients to have funding. Mm-hmm. So if they if they're putting people off at the very first mm-hmm. stage, then um, mm-hmm. it is in their interests. Mm-hmm. Whereas the police already have lots of in-house training, and I, you know, I've done work with the police on a separate thing much later. Um, so when they came to me, and that's always a nice way around. Mm-hmm. But but my initial attempts to perhaps do some training with the police didn't really come to much. What did happen though was that because mediators are often lots of other things, so you know there are still many people who are just mediators and that's all they do. Mm-hmm. I was in a, a workshop, I think it was in it was either in Milton Keynes or maybe in Hertfordshire, um, and one of the people who was in the training workshop was a ex. Um, or maybe not ex at the time, but a very senior police officer who ran the hostage and crisis negotiation unit. And fast forward a few years' time, he, he could see the, the relevance and the value in doing conversation analytic work on conversations that could be not mediation for neighbourhood conflict, but maybe negotiations with persons in crisis. And that project, in a strange kind of way, came out of a calm workshop for mediators. Wow. It just took a long time to get there. But this is why I always say you should follow your nose and just be ready for something unexpected to fall into your lap because you never know when an opportunity is going to arise. Yeah. Um, so besides um, mediators and police officers, um, what other professional groups have you engaged with CARM? Many. More and more. As you know yourself. <laughs> so Bogdani, you've been working with me and Ryan Sigfeland, um on cold calls. In, in technology companies. I mean, it, it, it's amazing really to think about how many different types of organisations via bits of public engagement that I've done have, have found their way to Department of Social Sciences here and um, seen the relevance of, of conversation analysis for studying the types of encounters that are in their organisation and using that to better train the people that... Um, they, you know, the, the people that they employ all themselves, um, and this has been from, well, sales call sales companies, lots of medics, different types of healthcare professionals, general practitioners, um, training companies themselves, mm-hmm. uh, supermarkets. Mm-hmm. In a way, there, there, there is no, there is no probably no field at this point that hasn't been in touch. Whether these projects end up going somewhere is a different mm-hmm. matter, mm-hmm. but there is a, a big interest mm-hmm. in there, a, mm-hmm. out there rather, um, mm-hmm. for conversation analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, so you mentioned public engagement, mm-hmm. and you're known to have done quite a few mm-hmm. pu- public engagement talks um, from TEDx a couple of years ago, um, the Royal Institution, Wiredex, um, uh, w- Wired UK. Mm-hmm. Um, the New Scientist Live, um, and it's quite hard for conversation analysts to to explain what they're doing without using the technical jargon. Um, what are your secrets? <laughs> Maybe it's an advantage that um, I wasn't ever trained as a hardcore conversation analyst, so I didn't have the jargon to have to lose <laughs> in, the, in the first place. Um, and, and, and maybe in a way that is the secret to the success that I've had in, in doing all of these public engagement talks. Um, because I'm very happy, ha- happy to say I'm not the world's best conversation analyst, but, but maybe you don't need to be to engage the public of, of various kinds in what conversation analysts do. And I think I've been quite good at doing that. So besides research and public engagement in your, let's say, day-to-day life, uh, here at Loughborough you are also teaching. And in fact, a couple of years ago, you were nominated for a teaching award. Um, what do you do um, in your lectures? What is your approach? Uh, um, I've, at the moment, I just teach forensic psychology, which is a, a, a third year option. Uh, it's a big course. Lots mm-hmm. of people are interested in forensic psychology. Um, in the past, I've taught mostly research methods. Um, I've never taught conversation analysis at this university or discursive psychology, um, although I do teach those things elsewhere, generally on you know sort of PhD student courses in, in universities outside of the UK. Um, I think my approach is is hopefully the same as I would have to other aspects of my academic life, which is be honest, don't blag, admit what you don't know, um, 
and try to be as engaging and useful as possible mm. in the way you approach all aspects of your work. Mm. I hope that would be my approach. Mm. Um, so besides research and teaching, here at Loughborough you're also um, an associate dean for research. What are your tips on managing so many different activities? <laughs> Try not to be late, <laughs> like I was for this interview. Um, it, it, it is difficult. It's difficult to, to juggle all of the different aspects that any academic has to juggle these days. Um, I'm not really sure if I have tips. Um, I try to get concentrated time to get through key tasks, try to prioritise. It sounds a bit naff, but it's probably true. Um, I try to keep on top of email, as most people who ever email me will know. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. Um, um, I have a great set of colleagues that I work with, and, and I would include yourself in that, um, and other PhD students, and obviously my fantastic RA, Ryan Sickmilland. Um, I certainly couldn't do all the things that I managed to achieve if it wasn't in collaboration with a lot of other great mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the fantastic projects you're currently working on? At the moment, um, let me think of the most, well, the most exciting ones that are really mm -hmm. engaging my mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the the one that Ryan is, is, is leading on more and more, which is looking at police negotiators talking to persons in crisis. So trying to stop somebody who is on a roof from jumping or trying to stop somebody who is threatening suicide from actually doing it. And that's amazing and we've been that was a that was the project that evolved over time from the chance encounter with a mediator in I don't know, two thousand and ten or something, two thousand and eleven. Um, and we have been, we've been doing that work now for about 18 months and we've done our first training with the Metropolitan Police who did that in, in London in, in May, no March that was. And actually this week I'm going to a negotiators conference and in a couple of weeks time to the Home Office to also um, do a, a sort of high stakes conflict workshop uh, with Home Office employees and, and the police. So that's really exciting, mm -hmm. it's not, but it's not just exciting, you know, it, it, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's grim. So when, when Ryan and I first started looking at these materials, it's really upsetting because these, by, by virtue of being a conversation analyst and studying real life, we're looking at real recordings of people who are really um, maybe nearly, near, near, nearly at the end of their life, and that's horrible. But on the other hand, we're able to identify what works and what is less effective when it comes to engaging mm. persons in crisis. If you just start from the assumption that every turn they take means that they're not jumping, then every turn they take is really important to get right, and so it's valuable to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other project, which is really only just starting to be a thing, and I wish I had more time to focus on it really, is um, looking at simulation and simulated encounters, which has been something of interest to me for quite a long time mm -hmm. now, especially developing calm and thinking about what am I the alternative to, and I'm the alternative to a role playing training. So I'm really interested in what, what role played encounters look like. Mm -hmm. And people might know that I've done some work looking at um, the differences and similarities between simulated police interviews and real police interviews. What's interesting about that is that you can see the differences, but of course the people in the simulation know that they're in a simulation. They know they're in a role play, they know they're in an assessment centre to for whatever aspect of police interviewing their training and being assessed on. So I've got a, a collection now which is looking at people telephoning the vets. So I'm looking at real cat owners phoning real vets, but I'm looking at mystery shoppers phoning the vets. And of course for the vet then, they don't know that they're talking to a mystery shopper. So I'm quite intrigued to dig into that data and look at how to spot a mystery shopper mm -hmm. from the first thing they say. Mm -hmm. And I think you can. So cool. watch this space. <laughs> All right. Um, so among other things, um, and probably plans for the future, um, you are planning to publish a book, um, sort of introducing conversation analysis to the wider public. And I know it's still a work in progress, so is there anything that you can reveal about that? <laughs> o only that um, it's not written yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, uh, I feel very... Um, honoured to have been asked by various publishers if I, if I would write a book about talk and I in the end went with Little Brown who are JK Rowling's publishers which is very exciting um, but I do have to sit 
down and find the time to, to write this book. Um, in theory, I have to write it by March next year, which is only four months away, so we'll see. Um, I've written one and a half chapters so far. <laughs> I, th I, I think I also want it to be a bit like some of the public engagement stuff that's online, like the TED Talk and other things. I want it to be something that the community can use and point to mm -hmm. as, a, as, an, as an introduction which is not technical, but engages people and makes them mm -hmm. see the importance of the work we do, mm -hmm. because in the end, um, that's the thing that I'm most proud of in, in recent years, showing the world as much as I can what conversation analysts do. The next couple of questions are about CAD which is in about a month now. Um, so for 11 years, you've organized together with Charles and Taki um, the, this one day conference here at LAFPRO, um, CA Day. How did that come about and how did it evolve over the years? I knew you were going to ask me that and I, I actually can't remember. <laughs> so long ago. Um, I, I, I guess it probably evolved in a chat in Charles's office. Other than that, I honestly can't remember the details, you would have to ask him, but what I do remember is that every single year that goes by, they just pass in a flurry, because of course, when it's a bit like being the host of any event, you end up just kind of running around, m making sure that everything is happening, rather than maybe relaxing and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. um, but they are an amazing and casual thing that has grown, and they, 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 I think a lot of people say that it marks the start of Christmas for them, so that's very nice. Um, so one of the highlights of CAD has been for years, um, until recently that is, um, your baking. Uh, so you used to do lots and lots and of different biscuits and cakes. Um, how come? Again, I can't remember <laughs> why, why, why this started to be a thing. It obviously started to be a thing when CAD was smaller at the start. And I think, well, I, I definitely had a phase of being into, into baking and cooking and actually, um, this is the influence of Alexa Hepburn because she's a great cook and I aspire to even do anything remotely that, uh, as, as, well as, as well as she can do. Um, so, I'm, so I was into cooking at the time and Derek and Jonathan and Alexa and I used to do lots, lots of, sort of eating together and I was into food. So I thought I would bake something for CA Day and then you, thought, you do it once and then you sort of do it again, do it again and then you realise, a bit like you said, how do you actually juggle all these things and the answer is that last year I just didn't because I literally didn't have time to, mm. to, to do it but it is fun maybe I'll try and do something this year. Um, Alright so besides um, baking as one of your passions um, what are some of your other interests? Um, I play the piano not mm. very well wish I could do it better wish I had more time mm. um, I read a lot of crime fiction um, and I run as much as I can I do all of those other things as much as I can and not enough as I'd like to. Yeah. Um, so, wrapping up with one final um, reflective question. Um, so, a lot of your work contributes to a feminist agenda and um, you've attended events where you've spoken um, to that topic. Um, what, what would you say, what, what would you say your um, contribution to that area is, if you were to sum it up? I want to get the, the balance right in this answer. I would like to get to a point where being a woman is the least interesting thing about me and is not a requirement for anyone to have to study. I think it's really important, um, and I think I started this with my, with my PhD, to not perpetuate stereotypes about gender. So I hope that me and you know other, other feminists who use conversation analysts have tried to show how gender really is relevant to encounters, but not the first thing one assumes will be relevant to encounters. I think that's the most important thing that I can do empirically. Mm. Personally, um, I, I, I guess like most, yeah, most social scientists that I know at least, um, you know, you just keep on pushing. All right, thank you very much for a wonderful interview. Thank you very much. Cool.